appreciate it. I, I just do. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, we're here. Let's all stand. Oh my gosh. I'm going to cry. Here we go. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Let me love, let me love in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Let me love, let me love in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me live in a holy, Serve in a holy, holy way. Let me serve, let me serve in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me know that love is all around. Let me know, let me know that love is all around. Here we go. Oh, let me live in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me live in a holy, holy way. Serve. Oh, let me serve. Andy Anderson in the house. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> and his wife, Reverend Bonnie Anderson, is in the house as well. <laughs> oh, good morning, everybody, and congratulations for being here on Daylight Savings Time Sunday. Missed an hour of sleep, but didn't stop you. Someone else said uh, from Grants Pass, high gas prices didn't stop me, so that's awesome. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. So wonderful to be here without masks, yes? Oh, gosh. Prayers for continued, what, whatever we call it, of the COVID, yeah, thing. Um, we will not be live streaming today. You may have gotten that message. Um, our captain of Sunday services, Bill Miner, is in the hospital. He's okay, but he had some heart stuff going on. He's in ICU under observation. Um, they're talking about alternatives. But I talked to him last night, and he sounded wonderful. I said, are you still in ICU? He said, yeah. But prayers for Bill and guidance about next steps for him, and prayers for Jason as well, another stalwart person here in our, in our Sunday team. <laughs> Jason and Kathy will be traveling to Florida, and Jason's dealing with a, an infection in his shoulder. And so, yeah, we just know health and wholeness for them and everybody in our community. As you know, we are a, an inclusive, diversive spiritual co community, and we're committed to teaching spiritual tools to transform both our lives and the world. We welcome everybody, no matter where you may happen to be on your own personal spiritual journey. By the way, uh, Tom Frederick did bring a camera and is recording this, so we may be able to post the recording later on, which would be lovely. So let's see. A couple introductions. Uh, our practitioner, on pulpit this morning is Reverend Dr. Linda Rapon. Yeah. <laughs> Holding high watch from home is our practitioner, Teresa Jenkins. And yes, our musician, I'm going to hand it back to you, Andy, Reverend Andy Anderson. Day. 
just another blessed day. just move straight into prayer. <sighs> Turning within and finding that the infinite presence of God is already indwelling in us. That what is within is also without filling this building with its holiness, with its light, with its love. And so I recognize that that which is within each of us and that which is without each of us and all around us is only God all the time. Hmm. So I bless this service. I bless this day. From wherever we've come and whatever's on our mind, I know that this service brings solace to the soul, a sweetness to the heart, a connection with other beloveds. So I bless the music. I bless the talk by Reverend Kimberly. I bless every piece of this service, knowing that it is indeed blessed, and so are we. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. It is so good to be back in person. <laughs> got to tell you, I am loving this. Uh, I have a reading today, um, and it's from the Daily Word, which for those of you who are uh, coming from Centers for Spiritual Living might not know this is the science of mind equivalent that has actually been around a lot longer than we have. The Daily Word is the unity uh, daily uh, guidance. And you might want to pick it up. It's real good. If you, if you can handle two. So, you yeah, know, oh well. Uh, this it comes from um, last month, but it's called I Am a Compassionate Presence. In periods of peaceful contemplation, I immerse myself in the unconditional love that joins the human family together in God. As the awareness of divine love fills my mind and heart, it dissolves all memories of difficult ties 
and feelings of discord. Centered in divine love, I deeply feel my oneness with God and with all people. I now see the people in my life anew, beholding the divinity of each dear one I meet. My heart overflows with empathy as I respond to their troubles and celebrate their triumphs. I am patient. I listen with intention. I recognize their divinity as I recognize my own. I welcome the flow of divine love as it blesses me as well as those with whom I am sharing my compassion. And so it is. Reverend Andy Anderson, so good to have you here. Ah. And you know what else is good? For those of you who were here last week, you probably know already what's good. We have a new sound system. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Tom Frederick and Anton Mizrak, who has lent us a 16-track new sound system, never been used, and Tom, who came extra duty to install it, was it yesterday or the day before, Tom? Uh, hopefully we won't have the glitches that we had last week. So thank you so much to you guys. Yeah. So some of you may know our theme for this month of March is mapping, I'm forgetting the middle word, mapping meaningful connections, meaningful connections. 
And the phrase comes from our book of the month, Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. And I'll be promoting our book study that's coming up very shortly about that. But mapping meaningful connections, last week we talked about oneness because part of forming meaningful connections is knowing that we're one, that we're all one, that we're all one life, God's life, as Andy so beautifully sang to us. And my intention for this morning is to answer what I think is a very important question, and it's this. It's posed by Brene in her book. What's the most effective way to be in connection with and in service to someone who is struggling without taking on their issues as our own? I'm going to read that one again. What's the most effective way to be in connection and in service to someone who is struggling without taking on their issues as our own? Can anybody relate to that question? Yeah? So, you know, we have different tendencies when it comes to listening to or witnessing people who are experiencing grief or trauma or any kind of painful emotion. One thing we tend to do sometimes is want to fix them. And part of the reason we do that, quite frankly, is because we don't want to feel it. We don't like to see somebody suffer, and we don't want to feel our own feelings. So if we can just give them advice or reassure them that it's okay and it's not really as bad as they think it's going to be, then we don't have to feel our feelings, right? Another thing we do sometimes is armor ourselves, and understandably so. You know, we kind of harden a little bit and keep them out here a little bit. And then another completely different thing we, we tend to do, especially if we tend to be empaths, is take on their feelings to the point where we're stuck, too. There's that old adage, if somebody falls down in a well and is stuck, if we jump down in the well with them, well, then guess what? Nobody can help anybody, right? So the question is, you know, how do we be of service and how do we support without doing any of those things, without becoming enmeshed or just keeping them out there, not close to our hearts? Another tricky dilemma, of course, because I'm talking about supporting people we care about, another tricky dilemma is how do we cultivate connection with somebody who we disagree with, we have a challenge with, we have a conflict with, somebody who completely disagrees with us politically, I know none of you can relate to that right now, either side, right? That is, um, that's a challenge. So my title this morning is Compassion, dot, 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 or Empathy. It's not really an either or question, and I'll explain that as we go along here. I'm relying in good part on the research of Brene Brown. How many of you have ever read a Brene Brown book? Isn't she awesome? So let me put a plug in right now. <laughs> We're starting on the 23rd of when, uh, Wednesday, the 23rd of March, a six weeks book study. My new co-minister, Reverend Michelle Ariano, and I <laughs> will be leading it here at six to, from 6 to 7.30 a.m. p.m. p.m. <laughs> here in the social hall. And we'll also, it'll be a hybrid class. It'll be on Zoom as well. So I just, I just think she is amazing um, in her research, in her writing ability, in her ability to express herself. So I recommend you get the book, either the hardcover or the audible or both. The audible is amazing. As Rev. Michelle pointed out to me, she adds things in there that aren't in the book. So it's kind of like the inside scoop you get a bit of. So I'm relying on her research. Now, let's see, if I asked you guys to name emotions, what would you say? What are some of the emotions we as humans feel? Yell them loud enough so I can hear. Joy. Fear. Fear. Sad. 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 Glad. Happy. Glad. Mad. Mad. Frustrated. Frustrated. Nice. Confused. Confused. Angry. angry. Yep. Love. Lo yeah. OK, so now we're repeating a little bit. Love, angry, right? Great, great answers. We usually come up, she says usually people come up with about four. Sad, mad, glad, angry, right? Did I repeat? But anyway, you get, you get the idea. <laughs> In this book, she documents 87 human emotions or experiences that somehow relate to emotions, 87. And she talks about how it's important for us to understand our emotions and to be able to talk about them and express them. So it's really... Uh, it's an eye-opener, I'll tell you. So let me ask you this. Compassion. We're talking today about compassion. How would you define compassion for yourself? What does compassion mean to you? No wrong or right answer here, but what would you say, what's compassion? Self-love. Self -love. Where was that, Greg? Was that you? 
Self-love, okay? It can be self-love. What's compassion? Because, can I, can I expand on that? If we can't love ourselves, if we can't be compassionate with ourselves, can we compa be compassionate with others? Probably not. Yeah. How else would you define compassion? Thank you. Non-judgmental, supportive awareness. Beautiful. Yeah. Anyone else want to take a stab at it? According to Brene, you know, you can look up compassion in the dictionary, but she likes to use the definitions that we carry around with us. That makes more sense, right? Because it's what we walk around thinking of. So here's her definition, and it's not just the right definition. It's just another beautiful definition of compassion. She says it's the daily practice, daily practice, of recognizing and accepting our shared humanity so that we treat ourselves and others with loving kindness and take action in the face of suffering. So I love that definition because of two qualities that we already mentioned. One, um, Greg, you know, it's kindness, loving kindness towards ourselves. The second one, I guess we haven't talked about, but her definition includes taking action. It's not just you know feeling with somebody and paying attention to them, being kind to them, but it's taking action to support or help them. Now, compassion is different from things like pity or even sympathy. In the Buddhist tradition, there's a concept called near enemies. And a near enemy is a state of mind that's very similar to the desired state, in this case, compassion, but it tends to undermine it. So, you know, it's near because it's similar, but it's an enemy because it, and pity, unlike compassion, keeps the other person at a distance. We feel like, oh, you know, you have that, not me, poor you. And we tend to otherwise, other eyes and distance the person. So it's not helpful. Uh, research is showing that if someone's ill or suffering, it's not helpful when people just feel sorry for you and, and don't really connect with you. Pity says, oh, that poor person, I feel sorry for people like that. <laughs> you can hear the otherizing there. Compassion, on the other hand, recognizes we all suffer and we all have strength to deal with it, right? It recognizes the spiritual truth of everybody. So here's another quote from Brene. Compassion is not a practice of better than, or I can fix you. It's a practice based in the beauty and pain of shared humanity. The beauty and pain of shared humanity. My biggest lesson, or one of my biggest lessons about compassion came when I was in my 30s. And I was working as a TV writer producer uh, for the PBS station in Phoenix, Arizona. I did a series on AIDS. My brother Rob, as I've shared before, was dying of AIDS at the time. And one of the segments I did was on an organization called the National Warren Project. They were an organization that recruited former IV drug users and prostitutes, most of them women, to go out and do outreach to help IV drug users and prostitutes not spread AIDS. So they were teaching them safe sex and they were teaching them not to share needles. And my camera person and I went out. <laughs> we were in some pretty, pretty icky places, you know, like crack houses and, you know, it was pretty awful. But I had grown up, a little background here, in a small town called Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, outside of Scranton. That was our big city, Joe Biden's hometown. And when we go downtown, like many cities, Scranton had an area where hookers would you know, walk the streets at night. I mean, we, most cities have them. And my dad would say the most derogatory things about them, horrible things. And so I grew up with this learned judgment about people like that. And then I met these women women who had been in the profession who were now trying to help other people get out, and women who were still selling their bodies and using drugs. And in interviewing them, I was, oh my gosh. First of all, every single one of them had a history of horrendous sexual abuse. I have that in my background as well. So it was kind of like, there but for the grace of God go I, right? They had been raped multiple times by family members and other people. And in hearing their stories, I 
I lost that judgment. And my heart opened. I felt a connection and a compassion. And boy, did that change me. So I never look at pictures or news stories or seeing women now on the street and think, oh, you know, isn't that awful or poor them? I think, yeah, I get it. I get it. And how can we help? I think that that, to some extent, that story helped. The other thing that happened to me as a reporter, you know, we all have seen reporters ask questions that make us cringe. You know, somebody's in the middle of a tragedy and they, the reporter sticks a mic in their mouth and says, how, does, how do you feel? Oh, I mean, that is not compassion, right? And, and really, that's manipulative because we're, we're trying to get a story and we don't care how the other person feels. But what I found, because I had a tendency to be a counselor and ended up later getting a master's in counseling, that if I could compassionately and respectfully interview somebody and get them to talk, quite often it actually was therapeutic. Even though I was getting a story, it was actually therapeutic. And I always honored you know, the request to go off the record with something. But we need to be able to tell our stories. And we need to be able to tell our stories to somebody who is compassionate and connected and respectful and listening. And that goes both ways. We need to do that ourselves, and we need to do that for each other. And not let things get in the way like the things I mentioned earlier. Like, I don't want to go there. So really, this takes a heart opening and a willingness to feel our own feelings and walk through them, doesn't it? We can't stay hardened and be in compassionate connection with other people. Now, empathy. Empathy. Brene Brown defines, well, she says, empathy is a tool of compassion. It's a tool of compassion. The ability to understand what someone is experiencing and to reflect that understanding back. Now, what she says is, people often think they have to have experienced the same thing. Like, she's had people ask her, how can I be empathetic with somebody who's experiencing something I've never had anything near like that happen to me? So I have a question for you. How many of you have known joy in your life? Raise your hand, please. How many have known grief? How many have known loss? How about shame? Uh huh. You're qualified. <laughs> you are qualified. It doesn't have to be the same experience. But if you've known pain like that, you get it when someone's, if you listen to their experience, this whole idea of you know, walking in someone's shoes, she says, is nonsense. Because we can't really walk in someone else's shoes. Did you ever express a feeling about something, have somebody so, say, I know exactly how you're feeling? Well, baloney, you don't. We're all different, experience is all different, but what we can do is listen and believe them and then relate to the feeling that we've probably experienced for a different reason before. One of my biggest experiences with this, and forgive me if you've heard this story before, but for about a year or two in Phoenix, I facilitated a support group for parents who had lost infant children to SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Talk about a heart-opening experience, OMG. They taught me more than I was able to do for them. I was just there to facilitate the conversation. But when they would go back to work, six weeks, two months, whatever, after a child would die, well-meaning coworkers would say things like, well, thank God you have other children. <laughs> or, oh, you're young enough, you can have another baby. Ugh, I get chills because, well-meaning, right? But it, yeah, maybe they can have another baby, but that in no way minimizes the pain, the loss, the grief that they're dealing with because that baby died. So these folks came together and were able to so well support each other and taught me so much about how to support someone in that situation. They would do things like the year after the baby's death or two years after, they would have a birthday party for the dead baby. And all the families would come with their other children and have balloons and celebrate because you don't forget. And it's not like you only have two children. You always have had three, right? A beautiful experience of walking with, of being empathetic, of being willing to share the pain. Yeah. One more little example. And, and you know, the other thing is, I don't say all this to be hard on ourselves. You know, I go back to Greg's comment. 
self-kindness, compassion is loving kindness to ourselves. We are going to make mistakes. We all have made mistakes, and we all will make mistakes, and the people that love us will make mistakes because we're human, right? So what we can do is learn and be open to learning and not beat ourselves up. But here's another example of, one, of something that can happen. A woman of color sits in a meeting in her corporation, and she keeps getting talked over and not recognized and not called on, and afterwards expresses that that was hurtful to her. And a white male, and I don't mean to put down white males, anybody could have said this, says to her, gosh, I don't feel hurt when that happens to me. You know, again, it's not your experience, it's hers. We have to believe the person and, and be supportive and ask questions and take action. How can we do it differently next time? I'm letting you raise my awareness. Okay, let's all breathe. I need to breathe for a sec. <laughs> Sympathy, finally, is interesting. You know, we send sympathy cards, right? And we tell people that we're in sympathy with them, and, and I think that's a good thing. But according to Brene, Jada shows that sympathy, too, is a form of disconnection. So it's a near cousin of pity. Um, Linda's shaking her head. Yeah. Um, so rather than the powerful me too connection of, of uh, empathy, it's, it's, there's a tinge of I feel sorry for you. And, you know, I'm keeping you out there. You're hurting. Glad I'm not. All right. Finally, boundaries. This is really interesting. Healthy boundaries are important in order to have compassion. Now, at first you might think, what? I don't want boundaries. I want a connection, right? We're cultivating connection. That's what the theme is about this month. But think about it. If you're allowing somebody to abuse you, walk all over you, talk your ear off day after day after day and not move, you, don't, you can't be in a position of accepting them and supporting them. You want to go, hey, enough, right? So having healthy boundaries is important. It's, it's self-care. It's loving kindness. There's a great definition. Um, I forgot who said it, but let's see if I can find it. Ah. Uh, Maybe later. <laughs> yeah, there's a great definition because it's, it's basically compassion is taking care of both yourself and the other person. The two go hand in hand. They cannot happen separately. Finally, I love this story. In regards to having compassion for people who are different, I, without sharing a name, someone shared with me just this morning a relative that has a completely different political view. You know who you are, I won't look at you. That's tough right now, right? How do we develop compassion instead of trying to convince them that we're right and they're wrong? Here's a beautiful story. Comedian Patton Oswalt tweeted, this is back when President Trump was president and he was building his wall. And Patton Oswalt, comedian and actor, posted uh, on Twitter a cheeky poem making fun of the wall. A conservative war veteran from Alabama saw the post, got upset about the post, and tweeted, I just realized why I'm so happy that you died in Blade Trinity, a movie that Oswalt had, had starred in. Minutes later, the vet added, and you shoot basketball like the sawed-off little man that you are. I don't know if you know Oswald, but he's shorter than I am by an inch, right? <laughs> now, one would think Oswald would shoot back something cheeky and, and, and derogatory, right? No. Instead, he decided to see his enemy as a friend. He decided to let go of the grievance. And this is what he tweeted back. Ah, man, this dude just attacked me on Twitter. But then I looked at his timeline. And he's in a lot of trouble. I'd be pissed off, too. He's been dealt some awful cards. Let's deal him some good ones. Click and donate, just as I'm about to do. Pat Oswald donated $2,000 to this man's GoFundMe account. He encouraged his 4 million followers to do the same. And in, in just a matter of hours, this man had $15,000 in his account, three times the amount he had asked for. The vet 
too gave up his grievances. This is the power, right, of forgiveness and connection. And the vet posts, these generous outpourings of love and support have given me a whole new perspective. I'm not a man who ordinarily cries, but I am truly humbled. Oswald, of course, had to have the last say. And so in response to his new friend's tweet, he wrote, this is why compassion and forgiveness are always best. Compassion and forgiveness are always best. I love that story because I think it's a model of how we might change the world one relationship at a time. How we might not walk in someone's shoes but listen to them and understand them and decide not to judge them. I'm heavily involved again in the Course of Miracles as I've talked about in one of our lessons, well a lot of our lessons this week, Linda's smiling because she's doing it too, Michelle's, a lot of people are doing it. It's giving up grievances, giving them up because what grievances don't make us happy, do they? They just don't. So the way to salvation, which is the, the Course in Miracles defines simply as happiness, is to give up the grievances, to forgive, and to cultivate meaningful connections. Wow. So I'm going to close with just a reminder that many of our sages, spiritual, just brilliant teachers have taught this. I mean, think about Jesus. He he befriended all kinds of people he wasn't supposed to. He talked to the Samaritan woman at the, at the well. A Jew wasn't supposed to do that. Remember when they were going to stone the adulterous woman because that was in Jewish law? He said, what? Let, let he who hasn't sinned throw the first stone. And he went to the home of a tax collector and had dinner. And that was a no-no too because tax collectors were believed to be corrupt by the Jewish people. But he continued to make connections and do healing. The other one I want to share with you is the Hindu yogi, Sachananda. He was reportedly asked by one of his devotees one day, what is true healing? How do we get to true healing? And he wrote two words on a board. He wrote illness, and he wrote wellness. And he crossed out the L-L-N-E-S-S in both words and circled the I and the we. And he said, the true path to healing, and I'm thinking healing the whole world, is to have the perspective of we rather than the perspective of I. I see a lot of nods. Oneness is real. Salvation is not hanging under grievances. It's about forgiveness, reaching out, making connections. Let's go into prayer. Andy's going to tickle those ivories for us. Yeah. And so as we take a breath, we breathe in the spirit of love, that eternal intelligence, that is love intelligence, that is giving, that loves each of us, embraces each of us, ex expressed and lives itself through each of us. Without me, without you, God would not know itself in as expansive a way as it does. And this is true for everyone across the planet. We cannot be separate. And when we think we can, when we think we can keep someone at a distance or pity them or condescend to them, we hurt ourselves. So the invitation this week and this year is to listen, to open our hearts, to be willing to walk through our deepest fears and our deepest grief, to know that we're connected, that being human involves both suffering and strength, and that that's true for everybody, not just the one who happens to be on top at the moment. And I pray, too, that we think for ways and that we open to be guided for ways to take action, to not just feel empathy for someone, but to donate to give our time, to give our treasure, to speak up, to really believe someone when they say they're hurting. And at the same time, I pray that we also keep our own boundaries so that we're not engulfed, that we're not enmeshed. Because when we can practice loving kindness to ourselves, we are in a better position to practice loving kindness for every other human being we meet. I pray that I'm guided to do this, and I pray that each of us, including myself, if we goof and we mess up, 
that we forgive ourselves, that we put the bat away, that we stop judging ourselves. Can you imagine a world where each of us did this? A world of oneness and forgiveness and connection? Wow. I know it's possible. I know it starts in the heart of each one here. And so imagining that light spreading from here through this room, through this town, through this state, through this world, to everyone who's suffering. And we'll include right now the people of Russia, the people of Ukraine, members of our own community, families who are separated, and all places across the world that are suffering through violence and war, abuse, knowing we can change things, but it takes courage, it takes open-heartedness, it takes compassion and empathy. I give thanks for this book, for this book study. I give thanks for this community, for this beautiful new space, for our sister community unity. And I know there's nothing more to do but to release this prayer into the law, that heart of God that always says, yes, it's done, and we say together, and so it is. Amen. That's the sermon, right? 
Only love can set me free. Time now um, for our offering, our time of sacred giving. Our ushers are coming down the aisle, so a couple words about this. Um, you can write a check either to CSLRV or to Unity Medford, uh, your choice. And if you're giving cash, we encourage you to use one of the envelopes in the pew in front of you or front row people. You'll have to ask the people behind you so that you can designate your contribution to go to one place or the other. We're supporting both, both communities here. So let's, um, let's say the affirmation together as I bless these two beautiful ushers and the rest of us in the room. Say after me if you would, graciously I give, graciously I give. from a place of love. Knowing that, as I give, Knowing that as I give, so do I richly receive. So do I richly receive. And so it is. And, so it is. and I'm going to do one more plug for our moving fund. It was pretty expensive to move in here and set everything up and clean the place and so on. Um, you've been very generous. We've received $1,330. It has cost us close to 2000 So if there's anybody who hasn't yet given, and thank you to all of you who did give, you can write a special extra check or put a special extra cash donation in for our moving fund. And this is the last time we'll ask. Thank you. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. And we are so blessed, Andy. So just a couple announcements. Um, Jean Hanna from Unity wanted to be here to talk about her upcoming workshop next weekend. She re-injured her foot, so there's another prayer request, please. And so she sent me this um, description, and oh, man, I want to go. <laughs> uh, Jean is an art educator, as many of you know. So this is what she said. Most art classes ask you to observe something, find its beauty, and express it. It is working from outside in. In this class, we look at our inner world, moments from our own lives, and find the soul's expression in it, mining the inner experience for the gold. The symbol you will create at this workshop is an expression of that inner gold. Does that sound cool? Yeah, Bonnie Anderson. Um, contact Jean if you want to uh, join it. Her email is in our weekly e-newsletter. It's jvanhanna at aol.com. It's March 19th, Saturday, from 11 to 1, right here, uh, 15 to $20 fee, and all materials are provided. Woohoo! We also, I'm um, going to ask Reverend Michelle to come on up and talk about our book study. Thank you. So I brought the book with me. It is like a tabletop book. It is absolutely beautiful. So I am listening to Atlas of the Heart, both on Audible and I'm reading the book. Mm -hmm. And what I love about this book is how it correlates to spirituality and how we're one and how we belong. But it also dives deep into our feelings. You know, there's the, those little um, quirks and like what Rev. Kimberly was talking about, the difference between compassion and sympathy, but it really breaks it down as individually, but also collectively, and what we're feeling and what's going on. And so it's been such a joy to journey with this book, and we're excited about the book study. It's Wednesday evenings from 6 to 7.30, and it starts on the 23rd of this month. And it's both live, in person, here at Unity, and online. And so we've already got, I think, eight people that are interested. And if you're interested in signing up, there's no cost. It's just a love offering. We just want to get together and delve into this book with you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Michelle. My co-minister, your co-spiritual community leader.
We're so looking forward to doing that together. Just another couple quickies, because Unity has a lot of stuff going on. Unity Tuesdays here, there's a lot going on. Um, let's see, there is, I think Janice is here, aren't you Janice? There is Tai Chi with Janice, 11 o'clock on Tuesdays. Follow, 11.30, sorry. Thank you, 11.30. I hope I got that right in the newsletter, but we'll see. And then um, at 1 after that, here at Unity on Tuesdays, Jean Hanna does a weekly Joy of Collage workshop. So both of those, come for both. And both of those are a 5 to $10 love offering, so each of them. Um, we, let's see, anything else? Drumming Circle happens here. Anybody go to Drumming Circle this week? Cool, cool. Drumming Circle happens Saturday, the second Saturday, with Gary Eby at 11. Um, second, second Saturday of the month. I think that's it. If you want to sign up for our newsletter, if you're not receiving it, please send Vivian, Vivian, raise your hand, uh, an email at cslroguevalley at gmail.com. We'll add you to our, it comes out, weekly e, week, weekly e newsletter comes out Wednesdays. Um, if you would like to request prayer, you can do so. Um, there's a button on our website, cslroguevalley.org. And I think that's it. Time for closing song? Yes. Uh-huh. Thank you, Andy. So as we say goodbye, practitioners are meeting after service, right after service. So by next week or soon, we will be having the pre-service meditation at 10. So know that we'll announce that. And we'll also have prayer available from the practitioners after service in the social hall. So for now, my friends, let's be kind to ourselves and to each other. Many blessings. Namaste. Thank you.